Thanks, Sean, for the reading of the Word. May God, as always, bless the reading, and may you find the Word of God in this reading, which you probably already have done, right? I mean, I really, this is not me venting. I've done this in the last couple of weeks, uh, but this is really not me venting. I'm just being serious. I could really just go home right now and say nothing else. Or I could say blah, 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 blah. All thanks be to God, and then we could sing. Because you all know the verse. For God, say it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever shall, whatever it says, then not have whatever it says, right? I mean, it's gotten wrote. I tell you what I wish we could do. Well, I really don't, but it's going to tear me. Don't, don't throw anything at me. But let's take our Bibles and let's tear that verse out right now. Just <laughs> if you don't want to do it, okay, you don't have to. The only reason I'm saying it is because no matter what else I say about this text, you're not going to hear me. You already know that that, that is the whole Bible, right? I mean, people have said you want to condense the Bible to one verse, you can do it with that verse right there. And people have done that. And so it is. But let me challenge you today. <clears throat> let's tear it out in our minds for just 15 minutes. I'm going to put it back before this sermon is over, okay? Because you know how I feel. No matter whether I like what's in the text or not, it's in the text and, and it's ours to deal with. So we'll put it back. But for a minute, let's move it. And let's see if there's something else in this very familiar passage today that maybe we haven't heard in the past, okay? And so we start. It is. Uh, Sunday night Bible studies are going great. I wanted to give you that report. I just still can't believe how at times um, we have these amazing coincidences. Isn't that the word that you like to use, Rick? Coinky dink. Yes, yes. Coinky dink. That is another pronunciation of God's middle name. Coinky dink. Yes. God coincidence almighty. Because it happened again. Uh, we picked out this study called Practices and we put it in for this spring session. And what do you know, but it's right on top of Lent. And what is Lent all about but practices? And so we, we had a good study last week, which was about confession. But the practice at the end was really about apologies. And so I was able to be super smart and correct the group and everything was all right, right? So tonight we study about money. I mean, this, it's a great study. I'm just, I'm just making fun now, but I wish you would come. There's three weeks left, and you don't have to have the benefit of the weeks prior. You can jump in anywhere. And what I really want to tell you about is something that will make some of you run out of this building holding your spinning heads as you leave. And it begins the week after Easter. Because we'll be finished with practices, and we're going to start a study on Sunday night called Painting the Stars, which is a study that has a whole bunch of really big words, but it all boils down to three or four very simple and very common truths. And it is a study that reconciles evolution and religion. So there's going to be some really, uh, what, what 10, 12 years ago were... Um, probably heretical ideas, but today are common knowledge in the science world. And so it's a study that says no longer can we as Christians ignore what science now knows to be true, but how does that not make the Bible irrelevant and, and, and not true? Because it doesn't. And it's a great study. I can tell you it's, it's a really, I think it's important. And I think that uh, everyone should plan to be here for that. But it's going to be challenging. Painting the stars begins the week after Easter. You know, there was one study that, that I didn't want to do. It's not this one. There was one study that I didn't want to do, and it took you people three years to talk me into it. But you wanted an Enneagram study, and so about a year ago, we did a study on the Enneagram. And I kept telling you I didn't want to teach it because it's a big old so what? So what? Why do you want to know this? And I know the answer to why you should know it, but that's never why you want to know it. You want to know it so you can figure other people out because you like figuring other people out. You want to know it so you can impress other people, you, you know, with how much you can know about them and kind of scares people a little bit when you tell them three things and they, they yeah, how do you know that? And you want all that. 
And those are the very reasons why I did not want to teach you the Enneagram, because you don't need any of that, okay? That's not what it's for. It is for yourself. Thank you, Barbara. Enneagram, what it does is it shines a light onto who you really are. Sometimes you are the one who looks at it first and says, I didn't really think that was true. You never say, I didn't know it. You say, I didn't think that was true. Or you say, I didn't think anyone else knew that about me. So when people discover their Enneagram number, the first thing that really follows that is tears. They cry. I, I used to do this work one-on-one. -on -one. We did the class in here because it was huge. It's the biggest class I ever taught. And then one-on-one and then, uh, -on -one people would come in and they would say, are you going to help me find my number? And I'd say, yeah. And they'd go, how are you going to know? Because you will cry when we find your number. And it happened to everybody. Even though Alan teared up. I mean, it was something to see. At lunch, at, at Abuelo's, he's like stopped himself real quick. <laughs> It's like Sean Artist, he said, well, I'm not crying, I've been watching Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> the Enneagram shines a light on you, and what it really does is it says to you, your game is up. Your game is up. You are found out. And once you are found out, you are frightened to death that this is exactly what was going to happen. I didn't want people to know. I didn't want to be found out, okay? Uh, let's shift gears. Remember that movie Tombstone? I like that movie. Tombstone was all about um, uh, Wyatt Earp, right? And wasn't that the one where Val Kilmer played that great character portrayal of Doc Holliday? Let's say it again. Say it in my microphone. I'm, Lean over. Me. I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah, you can't say it. You, you got a you got an accent. It goes like this. I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> Isn't that great? What's he saying though? What's he saying? He said, you're in trouble because I'm here. <laughs> your, your game is up, buddy. I'm here. What are other famous one-liners? I got one. Uh, remember um, Clint Eastwood and Dirty Harry? Go ahead, punk. Make my day. That's a great one-liner because you know what's going to happen after he says that, right? Pow. The bad guy is going to get it. Justice is going to rule. What are some other one-liners? Y'all got some? I'll be back. I'll be back. <laughs> Ooh. What, you, got, you got any more? You feel lucky. That's still Dirty Harry, but is, it a, is that yours? Did you say that to your dad or what? Oh, Bart Simpson. I didn't do it. <laughs> you know, we like that Hollywood can, can make one-liners out of justice, you know. When we, hear, uh, when we hear him say, make my day, we know justice is going to be served and the bad guy's about to get it, you know. And Hollywood does that. I want to turn you on to something in John's Gospel. Here in the third chapter is this great conversation about Nicodemus. And we thought the whole thing was about God loving the world and saving the world. But let me tell you what part of this is about. Jesus, in, in this passage, John has Jesus telling the temple system and the Pharisees, uh, go ahead, make my day. I'm your huckleberry. You see... I told you last week that that cleansing of the temple is in the second chapter of John on purpose. In the synoptic gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say the word synoptic, would you? Synoptic. Yeah, these big words aren't scary. Are y'all with me? It simply means those three agree with each other. And John is not synoptic because it's different. You don't have to read much of it to know that. One of the differences is in the synoptics, Jesus cleanses the temple in the last week of his life. In a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate that. Or maybe not celebrate it, but we're going to remember it. That in that week, Jesus cleanses the temple, is arrested, is scourged, is beaten, is taken to the cross, and is crucified. And we'll gather here on Easter Sunday morning in just a few weeks, and we'll celebrate the fact that Jesus was resurrected, did not stay in that tomb. Okay, But John's gospel doesn't have these events, at least the event of the cleansing of the temple at the end of Jesus' life. As I told you last week, it's in the second chapter. Basically, this is what happens in John's gospel. Jesus is there at boom, the big bang, if that's how you want to refer to it. It says, in the beginning, bang, big bang, was God. And the Word was with God. The Word was God and the Word became flesh. It's saying Jesus was there when God spoke and all of this came into being. The eternal 
Christ, as Richard Rohr would like to say. The eternal Christ was there present and is present throughout. And then in John's Gospel, that Jesus goes from the eternal Christ at the Big Bang right to he is in the Judean wilderness with John the Baptist shouting, this is him, this is him, the word flesh right here. And from the Judean wilderness, he goes back to Galilee where he calls a bunch of disciples from from Loserville, USA, people who didn't make it in the seminary, who didn't make it to the temple, who barely get into the temple at Passover, who can barely get farther than a Gentile can get in the temple, and those become his followers. And from there, he goes to Jerusalem, and John says very early he cleanses that temple because John wants you to know that this person and I talk about who was there at the beginning has the authority to cleanse the temple. Again, a temple that does not exist by the day that John writes. And just after that cleansing of the temple in the second chapter comes this story, this conversation with Nicodemus. In other words, in chapter 2, John is telling you that Jesus cleans out the temple and in chapter 3, he's telling you this is why. And so there it is. In verse 19, there's this word judgment. And the literal word in the Greek text is crisis. And in that same verse, there's the word evil. And the literal word is poneos. Poneos poneos is um, basically, it's called an evil that is degenerate from original virtue. Or it could be called original mischief. It's associated sometimes with Satan, the evil one, who is the originator of all mischief in this particular definition of uh, poneiros. In verse 20, the word evil reappears in the English, but please hear me, it's not the same word in the Greek. It is the word phallos. And phallos means uh, something that is useless or unimportant, something that from which nothing good can come. So now hear the conversation again. But back up. If you remember as this chapter opens, Nicodemus comes to Jesus when? At night, in the cover of darkness. And if you read this in Greek, it's such poetic language, bouncing back and forth off of words that Jesus and Nicodemus keep throwing around at each other. And then by the end of the chapter, it ends with the same declaration. When Jesus based, can you put that up for me? I want to just see the last two verses. And this is the judgment. This is the crisis. This is Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, this is the crisis that you and the folks at the temple have. That the light, who is the light? That's right, Jesus. John has said that from the first verse. Uh, Jesus has come into the world, so you folks at the temple have this crisis that I have come and to be your huckleberry. Because it says that the people love darkness rather than light because of ponios, poneros, because of degenerate evil from the very origins of things. And then in verse 20, he says to Nicodemus this, and think about it, you came in the dark, Nicodemus. All who, all who do evil, all who do that more complacent kind of evil, all All of those who are worthless and unimportant uh, hate the light and don't come to the light so their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so it may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. Is he not saying, Nicodemus, you came to me at night. You came to me in the cover of darkness hiding something. You had a hidden agenda. And I'm telling you, you guys have a crisis because I'm here to shine a light. Sounds a little different, doesn't it? Let me tell you about justice. I have seen people become somebody's huckleberry. And in the name of Jesus, I've seen them waltz right in and say, you have a problem because I'm here to take you down. And it never ends well. It never ends well. You know, our fathers and grandfathers talk about a day when if you, didn't, if you didn't do what was just and right, we'll settle this thing the good old boy way. And they talk about it because it really kind of worked that way. But 
My son is in jail because he heard too many stories about the good old way, the good old boy way, and he walked in one day justified and right and taking care of it the way we do, and he found out that doesn't really work. Or like my friend Kevin says, my heroes in the world were Archie Bunker and Amos McCoy. And when they said those things on TV, people laughed. But when I said them to people in real life, nobody laughed, Douglas. It wasn't funny. And I'm like, I get it, Kevin. It's not a good idea to follow John's pattern of speaking this. John is speaking over the temple system. John does not treat the temple system very uh, fairly or nicely at all. And for good reason. John wants you to know that Jesus is uh, Lord over that temple system. And in an age when the temple no longer exists and even the pagan systems are falling and you can't find a church to go to, John wants you to know Jesus is your answer. But folks, God's justice is not a justice where the bad guy gets it in the end. How many of y'all watched Daniel Boone when that series was on TV with Fess Parker? I should have I got my coonskin hat out today. Did you ever notice one thing about that show? At the end of it, the bad guy never gets killed or arrested. They always figure out that what they were doing was not right, and they always adjust that. And in some cases, they even stay and live in Boonesboro with all of the rest of the Booneites and the people that are there. It would be nice if life worked that way, wouldn't it? But unfortunately, the bad guys in real life many times end up in jail, and, and maybe that's what we need. But in God's justice, Jesus says this. See, folks, we can't preach this evidently without the 16th verse because Jesus is saying that God's form of justice is this, that God loves the world. And that God gives and sins and gives God's self to the world. And those who trust it, remember the word, pistio, those who trust it have this incredible life rooted in eternity from the beginning of things to the very end of things. And they have it now. And they will never perish in that life. And then I love it because they, whoever they are, who are just people who decide what we should do next, uh, they decided one day that we had to keep going from 16, and so we've imitated that in a good way. For in the 17th verse, Jesus says, that I didn't come into the world that the world would be condemned. I came that it would be saved. See, when God shines a light into the dark places of your life, like learning your number on the Enneagram, you are found out. And at first, you want to hide that. At first, you, you don't want anybody to know whatever that is, and you certainly don't want God to know. But then immediately after you are found out, what seems to come is a peace that surpasses all understanding, an amazing lifting of an enormous weight from your heart and from your shoulders. There is the next breath that you take after being found out that brings you refreshing relief that brings you life. There is that next breath after being found out that says to you, you are not only found out, but you are now found. That you are now known. That you are no longer lost. That someone knows everything about you. And guess what? They still like you. Your best friend is the person you treat the worst in the world, and they still let you hang out. Wow. When Jesus brings that light into the dark places in our lives, we are found. We are not exposed to condemnation or to eternity in hell. We are brought into the light that we may be redeemed, that we may be rebuilt, reclaimed, that we may be made perfect just like our Father in heaven. Now, here on this side of perfection, you are there. You are there. Whatever it is that you're hiding or covering up or whatever your game is, whatever your lie that you're working on and you're spending way too much energy on, it's not even necessary. 
The people who don't like you aren't going to like you anyway, and the people who love you are going to love you all the more, and God cannot be dissuaded ever. For there's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than God does, and there's nothing you can do that would cause God to love you any less than God does. It's a glorious light. It's a marvelous light. It is a light that doesn't bring us bondage, but it frees us from the bondage of ourselves. And still, we run from it. May God give you the strength and the courage to stand in the light silently and patiently. May God give you someone in your life who will mirror you exactly as you are. And may you not kill that person, but embrace them. May God teach you to even love your enemies who teach you things about yourself that your friends would never dare tell you. Pray with me, would you?